Dr. Craig, we have not had a chance to talk about Dr. Norman Geisler, who passed away back in the summer of 2019. Um, there have been so many people who have been touched by him, his apologetics work, his philosophy work. And I, I know that you've written some things about him on, on Facebook. You did a tribute to him. Very, very kind. Um, because you were his student, thought that maybe you could talk a little bit more about Storm and Norman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good uh, nickname for him. He he loved to fight, yeah. um, and uh, he was zealous for orthodoxy. Um, I first encountered Norman Geisler when I was on the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ right out of college, I graduated from Wheaton, and I was assigned to Northern Illinois University. Um, and the InterVarsity chapter had brought him over from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School to speak on the problem of evil and suffering. At that time, he had a dark uh, brown beard. And he gave a lecture that evening, and I thought it was just remarkable. Uh, I had never heard so logical and clear a discussion of the problem of evil before. And I learned that evening that he was the head of a program at Trinity um, in philosophy of religion, offering a Master of Arts degree. Well, that really interested me because, Kevin, I had wanted to go to seminary. I knew I was on my way to seminary, but I also knew I didn't feel called to the pastorate. So I didn't want to have to take all of the professional ministerial courses that are connected with a Master of Divinity degree. And so the MA degree in philosophy of religion seemed to be tailor-made for me. I could do my core courses in philosophy of religion and then use my electives to get Greek and Hebrew and systematic theology. And so it was a perfect uh, degree set up for me. So. Uh, over the next year, I prepared for the graduate record exam in philosophy and scored sufficiently high on that to be admitted to the MA program in philosophy of religion at Trinity, and then went in the fall of 1973 to study there. And I decided that I would get my toe in the water, so to speak, by enrolling in the fourth term of sun summer school. Uh, before the fall semester began. So I would just take one course to see what graduate studies were like. And so I took apologetics with John Warwick Montgomery. And in that class was a young uh, Indian student with jet black hair named Ravi Zacharias. So Ravi and I were classmates uh, at Trinity at the same time we both then took courses from Norm Geisler. Uh, he was the head of the program in which I received my degree, and um, I was educated under him and some other faculty there at Trinity. And the priceless gift that he gave to me was a stepping stone from my undergraduate studies, which were not in philosophy, to going on to do a PhD in philosophy at the University of Birmingham in England with John Hick. And that MA in philosophy of religion at Trinity served as that stepping stone from undergraduate work to then doing PhD work. So without that link, without that bridge, I would never have been able to go on in the way that I did. And so I owe to Norm Geisler and the program that he directed at Trinity an inestimable uh, debt of gratitude. I've had an opportunity to interview him on radio many times. I actually got in trouble. I, I was working at a secular or a mainstream station and I put him on the air one time <laughs> uh, during Easter to talk about the resurrection. Yeah. But um, Norm was a, uh, he was a Thomist. Yes. Uh, how did, uh, despite his influence on you, uh, how did you diverge, maybe perhaps from uh, uh, your views? Well, Geisler was a devotee of Thomas Aquinas and followed his philosophy, including his metaphysics. And he would teach this in his classes. And 
Intriguing as it was, I was never persuaded that Thomism is correct. It has a view of God that, frankly, I think is so bizarre and so unbiblical that I just couldn't accept it. But what I did come away from Norm Geisler with was a deep appreciation of the value of natural theology, of having arguments for God's existence as a preparation for any Christian evidences for Jesus in the Gospels that you might want to present. And this has been, and I think continues to be, an underappreciated field of Christian philosophy and apologetics. And so, again, Geisler there was ahead of the curve in emphasizing the importance and value of natural theology um, as a Christian philosopher. And that is an enduring um, legacy that I got from my education under him. Bill, his son David told me one time that Dr. Geisler did not like to read. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, but Kevin, he is so disciplined yeah. that he makes himself read the material and has for years, you know. And so uh, he was very disciplined man, I guess, to have that that encyclopedic memory and can remember all that and then write so many so much stuff, Bill. Yeah, he he had uh, and he, he read he had read everything. I yeah. mean, when he he would teach us the history of philosophy of religion, beginning with the pre-Socratics, and he'd read Parmenides, and Aristotle, and Plato, and Plotinus, as well as the medievals. He had read these and could give his own take on them as he he taught about these thinkers. So he was very well read, and I think it is a manifestation of enormous discipline, which manifested itself in other areas. For example, his colleague in the philosophy of religion department uh, at that time was the late Paul Feinberg. And Dr. Feinberg once told us a story of how he helped Norm do renovations in the Geisler's basement. They were going to build some walls and do some things of that sort. And so they began work in the morning. And when it came time to lunch, for lunch, Feinberg said, okay, well, it's time now to take a break and take lunch. Geisler refused to do so. <laughs> he wanted to work right on through what would have been the lunch hour until the project was finished. Until it was done, there would be no break. And Paul Feinberg, I remember just shaking his head and saying, you know, how do you work with it? somebody who's so obsessive? like that. But that, that is typical of his discipline. Yeah. And, you know, Bill, he was a real staunch defender of the resurrection, did a good job defending the resurrection of Jesus, um, and engaged in many debates. A lot of us have, have listened to many of his famous debates. That you know, that's, that's true as well. Uh, although I did eight years of high school and intercollegiate debating, the idea of using debate as a ministry outreach had never occurred to me, but Geisler was doing that. When I was a student at Trinity, I remember on one occasion he was unable to be in class that day because he was in Canada where he had a debate with the famous atheist philosopher Michael Scriven. And he really took Scriven to the woodshed uh, in, in this debate. And that inspired me as well. I began to see that the Lord could use my training in debate as a means of ministry. Yeah, Scriven and, was tough. I mean, yeah. everybody uh, he were, were feared debating him. Yeah, he was a yeah. very capable philosopher. Yeah. And to think that this, I mean, relative nobody from this little divinity school in northern Illinois would come and destroy him mm -hmm. in, in the debate, I think was just utterly unanticipated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Norm wasn't perfect. He was a mentor to, to many of us. Um, uh, he could be pretty stubborn uh, in his views, and he. Uh, 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 it seems, Bill, that if he if he saw something that he thought might lead to unorthodoxy, if he saw something that uh, that occurred that uh, was an erosion somehow, 
he would try to head it off at the pass. And so yeah. he was always trying to anticipate, wait a minute, that's going to lead to this and that's going to lead to this. And, I, and so he was, he was pretty adamant about some things. Um, I guess that comes with the territory. As well, he kind of got saddled with the whole inerrancy debate. He was big on biblical inerrancy. And if you want to see some great harmonizations, read his, his Bible difficulty material. Mm -hmm. you know? He had a pretty wooden view, I think, of uh, biblical inerrancy, which is paradoxical because his view of the Genesis creation story was completely non-literal. He did not accept young earth creationism. He didn't think the world was made in six consecutive 24-hour days, mm -hmm. but he didn't seem to allow the same latitude with respect to certain other parts of Scripture. Um, he wasn't a New Testament scholar or a biblical scholar. He was a philosopher. And um, I think in, in many cases um, he was uh, overly literalistic in his approach to biblical inspiration and inerrancy. Bill, as we conclude today, what would be one of your memories of Dr. Geisler? Well, one of my favorite memories was the Monday night colloquium that we would have in their home in Mundelein, Illinois. We got to see Norm Geisler and his wife, Barb, there as real people out of the classroom. And what we discovered were ardent, warm Christians who were witnessing uh, for their faith. They would hold Bible studies in their home for people in this blue-collar community, Mundelein, and the people who would come to this Bible study had no idea that this was an esteemed professor. For them, he was just norm. And he would attempt to lead these people and disciple them for Christ. Um, he, he cared about people that much. And in the Monday night colloquium that was in their home, all of us philosophy students uh, met together and we would discuss then various texts and issues in uh, their den. Now, in the den, Norm Geisler had built a rock fireplace all on his own. He, he was a builder. He, he worked in concrete and stone with his hands, and he had assembled this massive fireplace out of great boulders, uh, and he was so proud of it, Kevin. And so he would light this fire during the colloquium. Well, the problem was he didn't build it correctly with a firebox inside. And so as the <laughs> evening would go on and the fire would burn, you would see this gray smoke just rolling out of the fireplace over the front of the chimney and rising to the ceiling. Yeah. And no one dared to say anything. I mean, no one could say, don't you think you had to shut it off or dampen the fire or something? Yeah. It was it was just defective, and he would never notice it or admit it. I think he was just, you know, so proud of his fireplace. And so we would be almost asphyxiated by the end of the evening with this wood smoke uh, burning in the fireplace. And that was a lasting memory of, of our times with them on a personal level. He will be missed. Yeah, he was he was like a father to Jan and me. Very warm took a real personal interest in us and in our success, and I, I owe him an inestimable debt of gratitude for the ministry that I pursue today.